Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Let everything that have breath praise ye the Lord. Happy Sabbath. something mighty in this place today. I feel it in my spirit. I feel the Holy Spirit in this place today. I am so excited. I'm so excited about what Yahweh is doing in this ministry. I'm excited about what Yahweh is doing in all of your lives. I'm excited because, see, I know that this season that we've been in is coming to an end. This season of, of being in want being confused, being lost, being frustrated. This season is coming to an end. And I thank Yahweh for bringing us through. Can we put our hands together in this place today? Can we put our hands together in this place today and give Yahweh a mighty shout, a mighty praise because he is worthy. Not because of what he's done, but because of who he is. Hallelujah. Welcome to A Touch of Grace Ministries. It is a honor and a blessing and a privilege to be here with you today in worship where two or three are gathered Yahweh is in the midst so let's set the stage let's put aside all of our worries all of our problems all our frustrations let's take that out of the forefront of our minds and put it behind us let's focus ourselves on where we are in this moment prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls to receive the Holy Spirit Again, welcome to A Touch of Grace Ministries. Great Jehovah, great God, amazing and loving God, caring and omnipotent, patient and long-suffering God, giver of all good things. Yahweh, we come to you. We magnify your name. We praise your name because you are worthy, worthy to be praised. And God, now, as a touch of grace comes together, as we lift up our hearts and our minds, as we offer our sacrifices of praise, we invite you to dwell among us. city called heaven somewhere oh a city called heaven city called heaven 
city called heaven somewhere. Lord, I want to make it. Help me to make it to that city called heaven somewhere. Hallelujah. Truly, I'm living to live again. And I thank God. I give honor to God and certainly to your pastor, Pastor Harold Sutton. And I thank you so much, Pastor Sutton, for that very warm welcome. It is such a privilege to be here and actually to even be in your presence because I know him to be a fine musician coming second to none. Hallelujah. Glory to God. A very fine musician and also a man of God. I do thank God for this wonderful Sabbath day when I woke up this morning. I told the Lord, oh God, thank you for a beautiful Sabbath morning. Glory to God. And I take delight in coming out to the house of God on God's Sabbath. Praise the Lord to each and every one of you. I give you honor today for being here because I realized that you had choices. You could have uh, done something else. You could have gone somewhere else. You could have just stayed at home, but you made a choice. And so I praise God for you today. I'd like to do a song uh, today, praise the Lord, from uh, the CD. And it's simply called Give Us This Day. Our daily bread You said you would Supply all my need According to your I have but to ask and I shall receive, I shall receive to go from and share this love you gave to me to show someone who's lost and help them find their way all the way to truth and faith so they can be free whoa, whoa. oh lord you want us to be free hallelujah Lord, we need your grace, your mercy, and your love. And Lord, we need your spirit this day. Hallelujah. Lord, give us this day. Amen. That is such a beautiful song, and certainly it is my daily prayer. Because every day I seek to be filled with his spirit. Hallelujah. That's one of the first things I ask the Lord today. Lord, fill me afresh. How many ask them to do that for yourselves every once in a while? Just fill me afresh. We need to be filled afresh. Hallelujah. Amen. Glory to God. I'm going to do another song. Uh, my arrangement of the Lord will make a way somehow. It's from my CD called Lord you're my everything and Pastor Sutton said that I did have permission to make this CD available to each of you today 
and uh, you may have it for a donation. I'm not even going to put a donation on uh, an amount on it, whatever the Lord gives you, uh, and you can walk out with this today. So I pray that you will take one of these CDs home. It's called Lord, You're My Everything by Mayfield Small and Company. But today we're going to do, right now we're going to do The Lord Will Make a Way Somehow. So I brought my choir and the whole band with me today. All in the hands of Pastor Sutton. Thought they had waited too late But God stepped in Made Abraham his friend And gave them both the faith to wait Now listen Say God told that couple That they would have a child And that they would not wait too long And after a while He gave them a smile Their little baby eyes that were born I know the Lord will make a way somehow. The Lord will make a way somehow. He will open doors no man can close. The Lord will make a way somehow. He'll make a way. Oh yes, He will. He'll make a way. Made a way for me. Oh yes, He did. He'll make a way for you. I know he will. Make a way somehow. I know he will somehow. Oh, yes he will. He sure will. Yes he will. He sure will. Yes he will. He sure will. Yes he will. I know he will, yeah, the Lord will make a way, yeah, he'll make a way, he made a way, so many times, made a way for me, Jesus is a friend of mine, oh yes he will, I know he will, sure made a way, made a way down no way, open up my eyes, 
Let me see a brand new day. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yes he will. He sure will. Yes he will. I know he will. Yes he will. Yes he will. Yes he will. I know he will. Yeah, the Lord will make a way. How many know he'll make a way? Hallelujah. He's made a way for me so many times. And I know he's done the same for you. For God is no respect of persons. What he's done for me, he'll do for you. Up the service was letting us know that we're nearing the time of the end for all of the frustration and all of the rigmarole that accompanies our life. God is going to put an end to our suffering. And uh, even though the days are dark, we're still the lights of the world. And I ask God to strengthen me and to encourage me and to empower me so that I can shine for him. Even in a world of darkness, even in a world where sin seems to take full charge. But I want you to know that no matter what we go through, God has got it. No matter how deep in the slumps your spirit may fall, no matter how depressed you may tend to become, no matter how frustrated, no matter how empty your pocket is, I want you to know God's got it. And this song is simply telling us that there's no need to fear. No need to fear. No need to fear when times of trouble come or pressing storms beat at your door. No need to fear. No need to fear. Evil seems so strong Their pride and power Is not for long Be still my soul And trust in God And place your life Into his hands for he will never, never fail you. And in the morning, you'll see his face. No need to fear. Don't fear. No need to fear when the evil of the scorn boast about the things they own. No need to fear for what remains when life's brief day is done. Their glories are a setting sun. But as for me, of this I'm sure, God will redeem my soul from death. And he will Never fail me, and in the morning I'll see his face. No need to fear, don't Never, never 
never fail you No one can tear you from His love He will never, never forsake you And in the morning You'll see His face No need to fear Don't fear Don't fear my sisters and my brother I'm going to do just a little bit of I Love You Lord Today One of my favorite songs off of the CD I love you, I love you, Lord, today, because you cared for me in such a special way, and God, I praise you, I lift you up. And I magnify your name That's why my heart is filled with silver praise I love you I love you I love you, Lord, today Because you cared for me In such a special way That's why I praise you I lift you up And I magnify My heart is filled with praise Oh, my heart, hallelujah My mind, my soul belongs to you Oh, you paid the price for me Way back on Calvary That's why I praise you I lift you up And I magnify your name Hallelujah That's why my heart Is filled with praise I know at this point you just don't mind lifting up your hands when you think about all that God has done for you. Every once in a while my mind goes back to when he hung on the cross, when he bled and died, but he didn't stay there. The Bible says he got up on the third day, and for this cause, Lord, I praise you. I lift you up. And I magnify your name That's why, That's why my heart is filled with praise I love you I love you God 
I love you, Lord, today. I know you love the Lord in such a special way. And that's why I praise you. Lord, I lift you up and I magnify your name. That's why my heart is filled with praise. That's why my heart is filled with That's why my heart is filled with y'all can help me sing this very last line. My heart is filled with praise. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Y'all pray my Bless me. Real good. Amen. Thank you, Ella. Would you put your hands together one more time for the anointed ministry of our friend. Elder Mayfield Small. Amen. I just want to share this with you. We're going to really um, uh, uh, um, bless the Lord in our giving. But something that I want to share with you, it seems like every week, you know, every other week, Elder, I, 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 I go into this consecration period because uh, what I'm trying to do is, is enhance my sensories. Amen. My spiritual sensories. So I can fight against, amen, the enemy that I can't see. Amen. And so, you know, I've been doing this now for maybe about three months. Every other week, I fast all week. Uh, and to, you know, pray for our, for the saints, for the believers. It may be a watchman on the wall, and it's like every week, God gives me something. He's giving me something. And this week, and it was funny, uh, man, because I haven't, I haven't spoken with you at all. But you was talking about earlier how, how the Lord is going to release the finances we're going to have the freedom. Amen. And we're not going to go through those hardships no more. And it was the same thing that God spoke to me and he gave me a plan. Is that okay? Now, on next Sabbath, I'm going to unveil my plans. Of, I call it uh, gentrification and for a touch of grace ministries and our efforts to upgrade better living lifestyles for all of us. Amen. And we're going to achieve this goal by creating and maintaining a, a proliferation of financial growth for all to evolve, to develop gradually from lacking to living in the overflow. So there's not going to be any more lacking in this ministry. Amen. That's what God is going to do for this ministry. This ministry economic power structure concept is designed to empower the less fortunate and to create wealth and redistribute it back into our ministry for the people. For who? Not for the pastor, amen, and, and, and my dreams, but for the people of God by way of entrepreneurship, investments, and from our tithes and offerings. We're going to transform our method of giving from reckless giving to giving within our means and with intentions. Because Yahweh never intended for you, for, for your giving to be a struggle. In other words, let me say this. In this ministry, I'm not going to ask you to, to, to use your electric money, your electric bill, your BTE bill to pay tithes or to pay an offering. Can I say that again? Because that's not God's intention. I'm not going to tell you not to pay your mortgage or pay rent because you can't or pay your tithes. I'm not going to tell you that. That's reckless giving. I know some of y'all say, oh, oh, he's talking against tithing. No, I'm not talking against tithing. But God, see what happened for so long, a lot of these pastors have been taking advantage of people and putting people in harm's way because you're being faithful, you're giving tithes and offering, you're sacrificing because you're trying to be faithful. In the meantime, what do you do? Y'all know this. Y'all know the way the economy is now. It's rough out here. 
It's real rough out here. And God don't want you to take your mortgage money to pay tithes. He, he don't want that. Because God don't need your money. Whatever he needs, he can just have it done whenever. So when churches or pastors get up and say, say, you're robbing God. No, you're not robbing God. Tell him what I told you a couple of weeks ago about Malico. Uh uh, he wasn't talking about me. He was talking about y'all. I'm trying to empower the people. Because what happened is that you stay in the cycle. You stay in the cycle. The reason you can't have it because you're so busy sacrificing, trying to be faithful to the church, and you're taking away from your families and from the necessities, your necessities. And then when you get in trouble and come to the house of God and say, Look, I need some help, they look at you and say, We ain't no lending institution. See, this is the plan that God has given me. The demographics of the church, a social economic community, consists of five different classes. Give me three minutes and I'm going to be done. We're going to take up an offering. But I want to bless people. Amen. Because I'm tired of people suffering, being faithful, suffering, and pastors are getting fat and living over there in Wootenboa. And we have to live in low-income projects and an apartment because we're trying to be faithful. So God wants to teach you. No, God, what God wants to teach you. I, I told you, blessing. I, 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 go, go on YouTube. Go on YouTube. All my messages on YouTube. I shared with you a couple of weeks ago. Your blessing isn't about giving money, sowing and reaping. That's not how you get the blessings of God. Yeah, we use the principle of sowing and reaping. That's a trick, amen, through evangelism. Those guys get to travel, they want to raise more money. So they came up with the principle, the concept, because this is, it is a concept, it is a principle that makes sense. You sow to reap, whatever you plant, there's going to be a harvest. That does make sense. But what I said last week is that when the Bible was talking about having abundance, that he will pull you out of, uh, 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 open up a window, pull you out of blessing. And I'm telling all of those who've been sowing in seed, so no see where it's that abundance because I don't see it and you don't see it either. That's because that's not the word of God. When you go to Malachi, when they was acting with a man, shall a man rob God? It was talking to the priest, but you got to read the scriptures about that. When you read the scriptures about that, you will discover that Bible was talking about kingdom principles, righteous living. What are you talking about, son? Oh, what he was talking about, said, look. He said, you give those who, who, who mistreat you, love them. Read those, read those scriptures. Somebody's hungry, feed them. If somebody needs some money, give it to them. And then when you get to first 38, then it says that if you do the give, and I shall give unto you. Press down. But it's a contingency factor there. So what is it all about? It's about righteous living. You want abundance in your blessings? You want to, you want to be blessed and have the favor of God? Live righteously. Where's your proof? Joe. It opens up. Joe was a, a perfect righteous man who excused evil. A man of integrity. Look at his possessions. And even when he went through the storms, God gave him double. Look at Abraham. Look at Abraham. Yahweh told Abraham, that, Abraham, I want you to walk. I want you to walk perfect before me. I want you to walk honorable. And look how he blessed Abraham. So that's what I'm telling you. All this stuff in tithes and, and, and all this kind of stuff. That's that's not how you're going to get your blessings. And I'm not telling you not to pay your tithes, but I'm saying if you're having a bad week, your money is low, but you have to choose between make sure your, your mortgage is paid and your rent is paid. Make sure your, 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 your rent is paid, your mortgage is paid. Make sure your light bills are paid. Because if they're not paid, they're going to get cut off, and you're going to be in the dark. So that's what I teach around here. I tell them, don't you give your bill money. But that's why the Lord tells us 
those who are living in the overflow, more is required of you. If you're living in the overflow, then you can give more. You can take up the slack. Until we can get the other people on their feet. Let me close this out. This is what, and this is what our sermon is. We want to get the other people on their feet. I would say there's five class of people that you'll find in our church. You'll find the seniors who are living on fixed income. They're getting social security and all that. And I tell, I tell seniors, no, you don't pay tithes out of your social security. I tell them, no. I say, all you have to do is give whatever offer you can give. You put your time in after 60, 70 years. Amen. And now you're not working. You're just getting your, no, no. You don't pay tithes off of those social security that you can give what you like. Now, if God has blessed you every time God has blessed, then, of course, you can give according to how he blessed you. I teach people to give with intentions. Then you have the next class of people that have the government assistance. In other words, welfare. They get about $12,000 a year tops. And of course, other things to supplement, uh, uh, they get the food stamps, things like that. We don't want those people to stay like that under those conditions. We have to move them from being dependent to being a place where they're living in the overflow. Or at least where they won't go lacking. Can y'all hear me? Y'all hear me out there? Then we have the other folks who are living on minimum wage. What's the, what's the minimum wage in D.C.? What, $12.50 an hour. What kind of money? How in the world can you take care of your family on $12.50 an hour? You can't do it. To survive in this area alone, you have to make at least seventy dollars to $80,000 just to be comfortable without the supplements, government supplements and, 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 and handouts. We don't want our people living there. So we want to get them where they're not depending on welfare. We want to grow them. Pull them out that state. People on minimum wage, they rob Peter to pay Paul. Then we have the middle class who live from paycheck to paycheck. We want to get them from out of that, out of that area. Teach them the discipline so they can manage their monies because that's important. And to save so they can live in overflow. Then you have the upper class who are living in the overflow. So what are your objectives? Sir? My objective for this ministry is to grow our people, to take them out of poverty. To take them out of poverty and put them in the land of overflow. So whatever's coming into the church, the way our system is going to be is that we have the minds, intelligent minds of the church. We're going to come up with concepts and ideas where we can grow money, where we can support those who have gifts in the church. For an example, we have our brother Eddie right here. So what we do, we know he has that talent. What we do, you sow and invest in his company. Because as his company grows, that means his office and tithing, his gift is going to grow. But he can turn around and bless the church. So it's reciprocal. We bless the saints of God, the saints of God bless the church. That's the kind of flow we want going on. So this is what God has given me. I didn't mean to take that much time on it, amen. Amen. But I wanted you to know that where we're going, nobody's going to go lacking in this ministry. That's what we're going to do. And we ask you, God, to give increase. Amen. Give increase to these who are giving faithfully, oh God. You know what have they have need of. So, God, I'm asking you to supply all of their needs according to your riches. And, God, you own everything. Amen. And so, Father, we thank you. It is a pleasure to sow into the house of God. It's a pleasure to sow into one another. For we are your people, oh God, doing your kingdom work. And we thank you for that privilege. We thank you for the opportunity. In Yahweh's name we pray. Amen. Come on and bring your, your seat on up. My elder's going to give us another song. Put your hands together and let's celebrate what the Lord is doing in that young man's life. I wanted him to sing that song because... Sometimes we grow very impatient as we wait for Yahweh. As we begin to wait on our God, we get very impatient. 
But how many people know that just like we're waiting on him, he's waiting on us? Just like we're waiting on him, he's waiting for us. Thank you so much, Brother Marcellus, for that beautiful, beautiful sermonic selection. It truly set the atmosphere. I have joy in my heart on this Sabbath afternoon. I could go on and on and on about the goodness of the Lord. I could literally go on and on about his grace and his mercy. But I have a job to do. I have an assignment this morning, and I'm excited about it. I would like to thank my beautiful or handsome, because they're all boys, all men. So my handsome family for being here with me. On this Sabbath afternoon, my amazing husband, Kevin, as you guys have heard so, so much about, um, so much about him already, but I want to thank my amazing husband, um, Kevin, for being here, for supporting me, but um, just a little bit about, about him. Uh, we're going into our third year of marriage in November, praise the Lord. We're a millennial couple, millennial marriage. Um, yeah, you're okay. Um, we're going into our third year of marriage and to just see what the Lord has done in his life and how the Lord has just elevated him spiritually. It is literally, it, it gives me goosebumps and it's just so important that you, that you be with someone who can hear the voice of God because when you can't hear it, you have to be with somebody who can. See, what people don't understand about marriage, it doesn't mean that you're going to always be in the same place. But as long as at least one person can hear the voice of God, then that means the other person can follow. So I thank you so much for just being an inspiration to me, for making me want to read my word more and making me want to seek the Lord more. I thank God for you, and I, and I love you very much. And to my three boys, I'm so thankful that they're here with me, Kay, Knox, and Noah. Thank you so much for supporting Mommy, for loving Mommy. Um, this is birthday season in the River household, so it's, it's going to get expensive the month of August. But praise the Lord anyhow. All right, praise the Lord. Um, again, I'm just so happy, guys, to be here with you on this Sabbath afternoon. I promise I won't take up too much of your time. But the Lord gave me a word for you on this afternoon, and I'm truly excited about sharing that word. And the title of today's sermon is Waiting for the Gift. Waiting for the Gift. Um, before we get started, I'm going to go ahead and um, ask that you bow your heads and close your eyes as we give a quick word of prayer. Yahweh, Father God, we give you honor, we give you glory, we give you the praise, we magnify your name, Father, because of who you are. We understand, we understand our position and that we are your creation and you are the creator. Father, have your way in this place today. Use me, Lord, to edify your people. Give me a word, Father, that will deliver, that will strengthen, and that will encourage your people to continue the good fight. Lord, we give you the honor, we give you the glory, we give you the praise. Decrease me that they may hear you, Father. Let your light so shine through me that others see your glory. In the precious name of your son, Yeshua, the Messiah, we claim the victory in this prayer and saying amen. All right, y'all. Let's just jump into it. We're going to get into the New Testament today, the book of Acts. Okay, so let's go to Acts chapter 1. Say amen when you have it. Acts chapter 1. I'm getting there too. And I'll be reading from the New International Version, so our versions may vary, but that's okay. All right, so I'm going to start off with Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Yes, waiting for the gift. So today's sermon title is Waiting for the Gift. And that is Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. And if you don't mind, can we stand for the reading of the word? In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Yeshua began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of Yahweh. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, 
which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Can somebody say amen for the reading of the word? You may take your seat. I am truly, truly excited. So Acts chapter 1 gives us some background into what's going to happen before the day of Pentecost comes, okay? So before Peter gets to preach this sermon about Pentecost and before the Holy Spirit actually falls on them, Peter is reminding them of what Yeshua said because at this point Yeshua had already ascended into heaven. So there are four things to remember at this point. The first thing is that Yeshua lives. Say Yeshua lives. All right, he lives. That means that Yahweh has woken him up from his sleep. He is no longer dead. There is victory in that. The second thing is that Yeshua taught the disciples for 40 days about the kingdom of Yahweh, his heavenly father. Now, in the Bible, and I had to look this up because you see 40 days and 40 nights. You see 40 years. You see the number 40 several times. Matter of fact, Brother Marcellus is on a journey, a 40-day journey. And I said, what is the significance of the number 40? Right. And so as I was looking it up, it actually says that 40 days and 40 nights just means a really long time. That's all it means. 40 days and 40 nights means a very long time. And then it goes on to say at the time among the Jews, the number 40 wasn't generally used to signify a specific number. But listen to this per se, but rather more. It was used as a general term for a large figure. When it was used in terms of time and simply meant a long time. Thus the phrase 40 days and 40 nights, which just really is translated into what? A really long time. The number 40 has a symbolic meaning to Jews and also to Christians and Muslims. But the number 40 to Jews is a number that when used in terms of time represents a period of probation trial and chastisement this is not to be confused with judgment which is represented by the number of nine but probation trial and chastisement now some pastors like to begin to preach the the number thing and i'm not really deep into that but i found this very intriguing it then says as the product now we're doing multiplication okay so as the product of five and eight it also signifies grace. So the number five signifies grace and the number eight signifies a new beginning. So when you have five times eight, that gives you what? 40. Thus, when 40 is referencing a period of probation, it also often coincides with the meaning derived from the factors of five and eight. A period of where you have been through great grace and a period in where God is saying there is a new beginning on the horizon. So there's two different things that 40 can mean to you. Either you are entering into your new beginning or it is four times ten. Four times 10 four representing the creation of something and 10 representing perfect perfection and completeness so when no matter where you read in the bible whenever you see the number 40 just let your mind take you back to that place it's either going to be representing two things either it's going to represent that this was a period of grace, a period of trial, a period of probation, a period where God is giving somebody the opportunity to do the right thing. Or it's a period of new beginnings. Can somebody say new beginnings? Don't worry about it. It's okay. New beginnings. Praise the Lord. So it's important for us to just keep that in the back of our minds as we're moving through, through this text. But the next thing I want us to look at when you see Acts chapter 1, you, you notice that Peter is reminding them that Yeshua instructed them not to leave until they have been endued with the Holy Spirit. So he told them, after I ascend into heaven, you need to go back to Jerusalem. And you do not leave Jerusalem until you receive the Holy Spirit. Today's title is Waiting for the Gift. Now, how many of us 
feel as though we've heard a word from the Lord. And we've been waiting for 40 days and 40 nights. We've been waiting for a long, long period of time to the point where sometimes we grow frustrated in our waiting. We say, Lord, have you forgotten? Did I even hear God? You begin to question yourself, well, was this something that I am actually supposed to be doing? But I'm here to tell you today that you have to remember that in order for the prophecy to take place, you have to be patient and you have to wait. Say, you have to wait. So Yeshua instructed the disciples to go back to Jerusalem. And I find that that part really stuck out to me because I said to myself, how many times have you received a word from the Lord and then you thought he was going to move you one way, but he then tells you to go back where you just came from. Catch that. When we hear prophecy a lot of times, when somebody tells us you're going to get a breakthrough, you're going to get a this, you're going to get a that, a lot of times we start moving into this direction or moving, moving north thinking this is where it's headed instead of us understanding that Yeshua didn't tell us to move. All he said was that it was coming to us. But we have to wait on the gift. You can't chase the gift. You can't run after the gift. You have to wait for the gift. But what, what really blows my mind is this, that Yeshua told the disciples, not only will you go to Jerusalem, you have to wait for me to pour out the Holy Spirit. So the disciples then returned to Jerusalem and they waited. And it took 50 days after Yeshua ascended for this to happen. Now think about it in, in, in terms of time, how we operate, right? When you apply for a job, you usually check your email how often? Every day. So imagine every day the disciples are meeting, coming together, do 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 waiting, waiting, waiting. Holy Spirit, where are you? When are you going to show up? Yeshua said you were coming, but we, okay, so what's going on here? That's how our minds work, right? We are very impatient in nature, in our flesh. I call my generation the microwave generation. We put things in a microwave, we... Two, three minutes is done. It's cooked. The food is ready. You can serve it. You can eat it. We don't have time to do what? We don't have time to wait. We don't have time to wait. But in this, in Yeshua's explicit directions, he said, you must wait. So I found that very interesting. Now we're going to jump down to Acts chapter 2. This is when the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost and Peter is going to begin to, to preach to the people who were questioning what exactly was going on. Okay? So we're going to jump down to Acts chapter 2. I'm going to start off with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Pause right there. A lot of times, we step out on faith and we go to talk to people that may not know the Lord. And we begin to talk and sometimes they have looks of confusion on their face. And we can become offended because we can think that maybe they don't believe that God is real. Perhaps they're questioning my legitimacy. Then, all, then this is what the devil does. He begins to play what I call like a, a movie, a flashback in your mind of all the mistakes you've made. And then he tries to ruin your credibility and he tries to make you feel as though you're not credible enough to deliver the word. But somebody say that's a lie. 
That's a lie. And most of the time when people are looking at you in a spirit of confusion, it's not because they're questioning your legitimacy. It's because they're questioning how you have the tongue to speak in their language. See, what was happening here? These were Jewish people, but the disciples were from Galilee. So they're trying to figure out why is it? That they're able to speak this language. These Galileans are speaking our language. They're communicating with us in our language. Because the Holy Spirit had fallen upon them. So when you go out into the world and you begin to talk to people, they're not looking at you in judgment. They're looking at you with awe and confusion because how can you, a church boy or a church girl, understand me, a corner boy or a corner girl, a prostitute or, 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 or a, 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 a whoremonger? How can you understand me? Who gave you my language? But see, when you wait on the gift of God and when you wait for the Lord to pour out his Holy Spirit, you're going to step out on faith and you're going to open up your mouth and won't even know the words that are coming out of it. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit. See, there is power in waiting for your gift. There's a lot of times we get anxious as we wait, but that's the trick of the enemy. The enemy knows the more anxious we get, the more time God takes. The more anxious we get, the more time Yahweh will take. Why? Because now your faith is in question. You can't grow anxious as you wait. You have to be faithful. You have to keep praying. You have to keep believing, knowing that in the right time and in the right place and in the right moment, the Holy Spirit is going to pour out on you. And when the fire of the Holy Spirit pours on you, there is nothing you can do to get rid of it. So you got to be ready for it. So we're going to keep on going because this, this is getting very exciting to me. I want us to drop down same chapter, but to verse 17. So now we're going to do verses 17 through 24. <clears throat> In the last days... God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Mm. Everyone that calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, Pastor Sutton talked to us last week about us understanding that it's, it's, there's no amount of money you can give to be blessed. Right? You can't pay for the anointing. You can't pay for the Holy Spirit. You can't buy your way into heaven. That's what got the Catholics in trouble. You cannot purchase salvation. Salvation was already purchased with the sacrificial lamb, which was the Messiah. But what Peter is doing here, and that, that, that apostle Peter is a bad boy, but what Peter is doing here, Peter is getting ready to let them know exactly what was happening. He's going to use Joel's prophecy and he's going to use David's prophecy. So he uses two because, see, the Jewish people were very confused with who Yeshua was. They did not know his identity. They denied him being the son of God. They said that is not the son of God. So now Peter's going to have to deal with them. Peter's going to have to present to them what we call evidence. And he's going to do it with using scripture. So in this particular part, he talks about the things that are happening and what, what it means for the Holy Spirit to fall out and to be poured out on the people. Right? He talks about, okay, God is going to give us visions. He's going to give us dreams. He's going to give us prophecies. And some of us are literally afraid when we hear God's voice. I know for me, this last, these last two months, what I've been feeling and what I've seen in my spirit has truly just 
I've been in awe. I've been in awe because the Lord has been speaking to me in a way that he's never spoken to me before. He's beginning to show me things in the spiritual realm before they're manifested in the natural realm. And it, it's not scary, but it makes you step back and it makes you say, hmm. Then you begin to understand what the disciples experienced and what the apostles and what David was going through and why he began to just praise. Because, see, what you can't see in the natural, but you understand in the spiritual, you've already seen it. So though people are looking at you and saying, hmm, your bills are not paid. Hmm, these things are going on. You have a sickness or disease. Why is it that you're praising God the way that you're praising him? Why are you celebrating your trials and tribulations? It's because God has already revealed to you the end of the race before the race has even started. So when you get ready to run, you're running with a different authority. You're running not in confusion, but with confirmation. You've been validated by the Holy Spirit that this too shall pass. But what I find interesting in this text is when Peter says to the Jewish people, because see, they said once they begin to speak in tongues, they said they got to be drunk. They are drunk. That is the only logical explanation. And Peter says, no, it's 9 a.m. I'm not, we are not drunk, right? And that's what people will do. When people start to see God elevating you and God doing things in your life, they start to speculate what could possibly be going on. Well, did you pay somebody off? Well, did you sleep around? Well, what did you do to get blessed? And instead of them asking you in a way that will teach them, they ask you in a way that will condemn you. So what they did to Peter, they said to the disciples, they said, well, no, you have got to be drunk. That's the only way you're able to speak my language. You are drunk. You don't know what you're doing. And Peter says, no, I assure you, I'm not drunk. But see, this is prophecy. Yeshua said that this spirit, the Holy Spirit was going to fall upon us. And Yeshua told us what was going to happen once the Holy Spirit fell. So no, I'm not drunk. You can tell your haters, I'm not crazy. You can tell them I'm not tripping. I'm walking in my anointing and I'm waiting for the gift. Say, I'm waiting for the gift. I am waiting for the gift. So in verse 22, Peter says, men of Israel, listen to this. Yeshua of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God said purpose and foreknowledge and you with the help of wicked men put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But Yahweh raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Hmm. Now, this is where it gets a little tricky. This is when it becomes about us. I broke this into two parts. The first part, Peter declares, and this is what he's telling the people. He declares that Yahweh the Father was intimately involved in Yeshua's ministry. And what I mean by that is this. As we go through life and we make mistakes and we fall down, a lot of times people will look at you in your mess and they begin to point the finger. They look at you and they accuse you of doing things you've never done. They accuse you of being a no good loser, a low down, low life. They talk about you like a dog. These things happen. But what I'm here to remind you is that even all of that is a part of God's plan. See, everything he does is intentional. He's not an accidental God. He's not a coincidental God. Everything is with purpose. And it is strategically done. So Peter declares that Yahweh the Father was intimately involved in Yeshua's ministry. While human hands were sinfully involved in the death of Yeshua. So what I'm going to tell you is this. You're waiting for your gift. God is calling you to a specific place. Now maybe your boss fired you. 
right? Maybe somebody introduced you to drugs or alcohol. Maybe somebody introduced you to gambling. Maybe you picked up a bad habit along the way, but it's a part of God's plan for you to be right where you are. And don't believe the lies of other people. Remember the prophecy that God has already given to you about your life. See, humans have a role in God's plan. It, were, it was the humans that nailed Yeshua to the cross. Yahweh didn't put his son on the cross. Be very clear. Sometimes we have a belief or we have a way of thinking that because we serve God, that we are, a, we are, we are exempt from going through human suffering, that we are exempt from being lied on or talked about or mistreated or abused. You are not exempt from people hurting you. You are protected so that when they hurt you, it doesn't kill you because death has no hold on what belongs to God. That's a spiritual death. That's an emotional death. That's physical death. Death has no authority on what belongs to God. So the second part of this is Yeshua's coming was a part of the divine plan. His ministry was divinely empowered. Some of us try to walk and we don't understand why things are not falling into place. Like Pastor Sutton said last week, it's because we're not living a righteous lifestyle. You can call on the name of the Lord all you want, but if what you're saying and what you're doing is not in alignment with what he's doing, then it's not going to work. You're going to find yourself in a wilderness for 40 days and for 40 nights. And remember, that can either be a time of new beginning or it can be a time of trial and probation. The choice is yours. Because, see, while we're waiting on God, God is waiting on us. So the next part of this is that Yeshua's death was also a part of Yahweh's eternal purpose. And when Yeshua died, Yahweh raised him in vindication of his claim to be the promised Messiah. At that part, Peter had some fun with them, and he began to talk about David's prophecy. If you read verses 32 through 36 on your own, I'm going to just quickly go over it. It says, God has raised this Yeshua to life. And we are all witnesses of the fact, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all of Israel be assured of this. God has made this Yeshua, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, Peter was having some fun with that one. He was letting them know that, no, 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 no. David is not the one who was ascended. Yeshua, the one you nailed to the cross, was the one that ascended into heaven. And what I love about that, and I'm going to go ahead and put a tab right there because I'm going to preach from this. But what I love about that, this is what I think of that. I think of all the people that had something negative to say about me. All the people that said I wasn't going to be anything. I wasn't going to accomplish anything. I had nothing more to give. All of those people, God is going to vindicate me the same way he did his son. Exalted to the right hand of God, he received from the father the promised Holy Spirit. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Waiting for the gift. What is the gift? Are we waiting for the gift of prosperity? No. I believe in breakthroughs, but are we waiting for the gift of breakthrough? No. We are waiting on the gift of power authority 
pastor said something and he touched on it. He said, at one, some point the devil's going to say, don't, don't mess with that family. And I'm here to tell y'all that that time has come. Little did he know. See, there's going to come a point in time in your life that once you begin to wait on God and you begin to align yourself like what the disciples did and you just wait and you wait and you wait, but you prepare yourself because season is everything. We're in the season of preparation. See, as we're waiting on God, God is waiting on us. God can't unleash anything upon us until we are ready for what he has for us. So if we're not ready, then we must continue to wait. And in this season of waiting, the disciples had several things that they had to do. They had to figure out who was going to replace Judas because we know Judas did what? He betrayed Yeshua. He was, the, he was the tool that was needed. So there's somebody that's close to you who's going to betray you. There's somebody around you that's going to let you down. There's somebody around you waiting for your demise. But what they don't know is that they are a part of the divine plan that God strategically placed a Judas in your life so that they could set you up so God could pull you out. God strategically placed a Judas in your life to stab you in the back so God could take out the sword and heal the the wound there is a Judas in your life who is supposed to take you to the next step so several things happened while they were waiting for the day of Pentecost as they were waiting Judas died then after Judas died they had to figure out who was going to be his replacement hmm season of preparation what are we preparing for? We're preparing for the gift. The gift is coming. We're in a season of preparation. If God hasn't revealed to you who that person was in your life that had no business being there or the person who was there to set you up, it's coming. And when it comes, you have to be ready because now you have to understand that the person who was a placeholder, God is getting ready to send in somebody new. He's getting ready to send in somebody who's going to elevate you to the next level. There's going to be a friend, a co-worker, a boss. Somebody's going to give you a promotion. Somebody's going to pick up the phone and call you. A doctor's going to tell you you've been healed. Somebody is going to come into your life. And they're going to help usher you into this new season that God has been preparing you for. But remember, you got to be patient because if you're not patient, then God is going to make you wait. You don't rush the creator because we are his creation. He knows us from the inside out. He understands everything about us. What the devil wants us to think is that everything is just happenstance. No, 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 no. Nothing is happenstance. God is strategic. There's nothing coincidental about him. He planned out creation. He planned out your conception. He planned out your life. He planned out your purpose. And as the devil saw God's plans, the devil began to make some plans of his own. And because we are sinful in nature, a lot of us run to the devil's plans before we run to the gift of God. So we get some bumps and bruises and scratches and scrapes along the way. But what the enemy doesn't want you to know is that that too is a part of God's divine plan. You messing up is a part of divine plan. You making mistakes was a part of God's divine plan. Because it was in that moment that you hit rock bottom that you were able to cry out for the Lord. And all you got to do to be saved is call on the name of. That's what Peter said. Peter said, all you have to do is call on the name of the Lord. And once the Holy Spirit is poured out upon God's children, then and only then will you receive the gift. But the gift is not financial release. The gift is not good health. The gift is not prosperity. The gift is not even peace of mind or joy. The gift is the power of God. See, when you begin to get into the apostolic teachings, you begin to understand why Peter and Paul were some bad apostles. Those are some bad boys because the way that they preached, they didn't have to, they didn't have to impress you. They didn't have to tell a story. They told straight scripture. Everything they did was scripture based. It wasn't based on opinion. So I'm not here to be your best friend. I'm here to tell you what the word of God says. The word of God says that if you wait for the day of Pentecost, then the gift of God is going to pour out on you. And that people will look at you in a state of confusion, not understanding how and why you have the gift. But instead of them being able to say, wow, 
Look at that. They're going to question your legitimacy. But as you continue to read, I'm going to take my seat. I want you to go home and read the rest of that book. Because what ends up happening is after Peter is done with them, they say, well, what can we do to make this thing right? So those people that counted you out, those people that thought that you were going to be nothing and equate to nobody, those people that talked about you like a dog, those people that always had something negative to say whenever your name was mentioned, those same people are going to need you. Those same people are going to call you. Those same people are going to be looking to you for direction. Why? Because you have aligned yourself with the will of God. Because you have put yourself in the upper room. Because you have allowed the day of Pentecost cause to fall upon your life and now the gift of God has poured out on you and what I love about it it didn't say that the gift was watery tongue it said fire fire is what hot fire will burn you so rest assured that once you wait for your gift that when Yahweh is ready and when you have aligned yourself and your 40 days and 40 nights is over and you have been through your period of trial and probation and you have proven to God that you are not only his but you're faithful that no matter what the devil does you're faithful that no matter what the enemy says you're faithful no matter what the doctor says you're faithful once your time of trial and probation is up God is going to pour out his Holy Spirit on your life and that fire is going to go before you and it's going to light the pathways that were dark. That fire is going to go before you and it's going to burn down to the ground Satan's dominion on earth. That fire that God has unleashed upon you is going to go before you and make your pathway straight. It's going to cover you in your storm. It's going to give you joy when you should be crying. It's going to give you peace when you should be frustrated. It's going to to be your rock that is your gift so right now in this season I know it can be hard I know this season can be frustrating I know this season can be confusing but what I promise you is that if you align yourself with the Lord's word and you believe in your heart the prophecies that Peter already spoke and you understand the positioning that you're in right now in your life. The Lord is going to speak to you and he's going to give you peace and comfort as you wait. He's not going to speed up, be very clear. He's not going to speed up the process, but he will give you peace and he will give you comfort while you wait for your gift. Amen. Put your hands together in this place today. If you feel victorious, I'm done. That's my time. I told you I wouldn't be long. But I pray that you are blessed. I pray that God talks to your heart. I pray that you meditate on this word as you drive home. I pray. I pray that word blessed you as it blessed me. You got to wait on your gift. You're waiting on the gift. You're not waiting for anything else. Understand that what's already happened in the spiritual because it's already done. Yahweh's already done it. He's already done it. It's already done. It's done. We're waiting for the physical manifestation of what has happened in the spiritual realm in our flesh. But as our flesh waits, we must align our spirit with heaven. So that we can be ready for the Holy Spirit to pour out that fire on us. That we can go forth in our gift. That we no longer go lacking. That we no longer go in need. But that we walk in authority. The authority given to us. By Yahweh our Father. Through Christ the Messiah his son. Who ascended into heaven and left with us the Holy Spirit. We have the authority. We're just waiting for that gift. Amen. Lifting hands, Father, we thank you for your presence in this place today. We thank you for your glory that we felt in this place on today, oh God. Now, God, we thank you for all that you allowed to come to hear this rich, powerful word. 
And God, pray, we pray that we will hear this word and understand that you are a, a, an on-time God. And no matter whatever we have need of, you will supply God if we just wait on you. Not to try to fix it ourselves, not to try to do it ourselves, but we wait on you. We wait on that anointing. We wait on that gift, the gift that will break every yoke and set your people free. Now, God, as we depart from this place, but never from this, from your presence, your presence. God, be with us. Never leave us. Never leave us, oh God. Hold us, oh God. Hold us, oh God. So we can be faithful. Let us know that you're always there with us. And we will serve you. We will honor you. In Yahshua's name we pray. Now may the peace of God enfold you. May his love forever hold you. May his spirit rest upon your life and satisfy your souls. In Yahshua's name we pray. Amen.